Okay, everyone. So now let us uh, have a look at the questions for tonight, uh, and uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, so uh, <coughs> we'll just start from the beginning and uh, take it forward. So first one. Uh, uh, I'm a bit nervous about the grip interview. What goes on? <laughs> is it is it like a uh, like a what a job? Is it like a job interview? Okay. <laughs> um, should, should I bring a CV? Do I get cat kicked out if I fail? Et <laughs> uh, is it? A, yeah, so, right, okay. <laughs> uh, the idea is just to uh, have a chance to have a chat, really. Don't have to say anything if you don't want to. No need to bring a CV. Uh, if you bring a CV, it means you want to become a monastic. Yeah, that's what it means. Uh, so, you kind of, that's the only, only kind of job interview we have, is if you want to wear brown. So, if you want to wear brown, then at the end of the retreat, you just come, bring a razor, and we'll shave your head, and we'll get you ready for the next stage. Uh, let we'll see what happens. And just, just come along and just uh, enjoy yourself and hang out. If you don't want to say anything, that's fine. Uh, and if you have any comments or you want to say something, or you have any questions or whatever, you can ask, but you don't really have to say anything. Yeah. And sometimes it can be nice just to hear other people's questions. Yeah? You can learn from that as well. Uh, and this is one of the reasons we have these Q&A sessions in the evening, because one person's question is usually another person's question. Uh, we are tend to be very similar as human beings. Uh, yeah, it's kind of really boring, actually. Uh, <laughs> you travel, it's interesting, you travel around the world, and I have traveled a lot during my lifetime, uh, and people everywhere are basically the same. Uh, and there's a superficial differences in culture, superficial difference in the kind of food we eat, the way we dress, we look a bit different, but uh, really, in, you know, in our kind of hearts and in the, what we aspire for in the world and the things we want to avoid and these kind of things, we are pretty much the same. Uh, Everyone wants to be reasonably happy, everyone wants to avoid suffering and problems, uh, everyone is a bit deluded, everyone is a bit confused, you know, I mean, this is humanity for you, and it doesn't make all that much difference where you go. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so please just come and see what happens, uh, and then, uh, uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, so next one. Dinaja. Thank you for your wonderful teachings. When pity arises, should we continue uh, with the breath as the main object of meditation or dwell more on the pity and let the breath fade into the background uh, or experiment many things? It's kind of, uh, you, you are with both, right? Uh, but the, the deeper you go, the more the breath tends to fade into the background. Uh, and uh, it is never really, you don't want to, ever really focus too hard on the breath, because focusing hard on anything yeah, is like concentration, and concentration is a banned word. Yeah. And anyone who has ever heard Ajahn Brahm, you know concentration is banned from the Buddhist vocabulary. Yeah. And uh, use stillness, uh, use words like samadhi, use words that... Uh, but the Sujato has immersion, I don't know if that works, immersion, it's a bit dry maybe, immersion. Uh, immersion, uh, kind of, it may be meaningful, but... Uh, I like stillness, actually, Adam Brahms' translation to me is a, is a nice translation. Um, so just, uh, you know, it's, the idea is to have an easy uh, kind of uh, uh, relationship with these things. Uh, the moment you try too hard, it becomes uncomfortable. And the nice thing about PT, it, it draws you in. Uh, you don't have to try very hard because it's kind of fun to be with. Uh, and so it kind of, uh, kind of, so just follow the natural inclination of the mind uh, and see what happens. But the breath, should still be there in the background as a kind of anchor uh, to make sure you don't drift too far. Sometimes you can lose the PT. The PT disappears uh, because your focus disappears a little bit. Uh, and that's why the breath is useful, because the breath kind of tells you whether you still are focusing properly, whether you're really there or not properly, or whether you are kind of drifting slightly. Uh. So uh, feel what feels right to you. Uh, yeah, just go, go gently uh, and see what happens. Uh, and uh, you kind of find that right balance. So. Okay. <clears throat> okay, asking on behalf of a friend who isn't here, honestly. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
How long is the waiting list for ordination at Bodhinana Monastery? Thank you. <laughs> okay. The friend should come here, you know, if you're interested in Bodhinana Monastery, you should come here. Otherwise, you go down the waiting list straight away if you don't <laughs> come to these, uh, these things. Uh, one of the things that we do at uh, Bodhinana Monastery, we do, you know, people who come and people who hang out for us for a while, they usually get a preference uh, because we know who they are. Yeah, and when we know who someone is and we know a bit about their character, uh, either they go up the list or if they have the wrong character, they go down the list. <laughs> Usually everybody has the right character. Yeah? People who come to the monastery are usually good people. So the chances of going down the list are very small. Uh, so come to the monastery, stay with us for a while, and say you want to go on the list. Uh, make sure Ajahn Brahm notices you. Uh, yeah? so, so jump up and down in front of Ajahn Brahm. Do something funny. Tell him a joke. Oh, that's the way to get his attention. Right? Tell him a nice joke. Yeah? Then you're going to be in business. The idea is to be noticed a little bit. Uh, so we have some idea who you are. Uh, yeah? And then uh, there is a chance. But really, the waiting list is quite long, unfortunately. Uh, if you are Australian, you have a reasonable chance of becoming or getting ordination because Australians have to have preference. Uh, that has to do with immigration regulations and that sort of thing. We have to give preference to Australian candidates. Uh, so if you can somehow become Australian, uh, yeah, that's kind of a smart move. Uh, so see if you can do that. And Australian actually is not impossible. It depends on the kind of... Uh, qualifications you have in these kind of things. And if you have the right kind of qualifications, you can get all kind of bonus points. And you may actually be able to migrate to Australia. Some people have migrated to Australia precisely to ordain at Bodhinyana Monastery, right? That's how desperate they have been there. <laughs> we had a young Englishman who ordained with us very recently. He has been on the waiting list for five years. That is how determined he was to ordain at Bodhinyana Monastery, yeah? And he's been kind of uh, asking and writing letters regularly. When can I come? When can I come? Uh, should I ordain somewhere else? I'm f five years is a long time, uh, you know, what should I, what should I do next? Uh, uh, and that is, uh, I don't know, there's something really beautiful about that. And then he was ordained recently, he became an Anagarika. Uh, and he was just crying, really crying, his tears flowing down as he was kind of getting ordained. Because finally, after five years, he had made it through the eye of the needle. And it was really hard to get in. It was a very moving ordination to see someone so dedicated and so emotionally kind of um, uh, involved in this whole idea. Yeah? It was a very, very moving ordination ceremony. Yeah? So uh, that is a kind of commitment sometimes you need. Uh, yeah? And uh, of course, that's a very good starting point for your monastic career if you have that kind of commitment and that kind of perseverance. Uh, so it is hard to give an exact time for how long you have to wait. It really depends on the number of things. But this fellow, he just got ordained uh, after five years. You can expect the chance of getting ordained in less than three or four years, it's very small, let's put it that way. Yeah. Okay, oh, this is an innovative uh, little piece of paper. Huh? Lindor, this is a chocolate. Uh, you, <laughs> you choose the moment, we will provide the bliss. <laughs> I think uh, I've copied that from the suttas or something. Uh, this is. Uh, <laughs> That's, that's called the copyright breach. We have to do something like that. Uh. <laughs> so I don't think they really understand bliss. But anyway, so. <clears throat> yeah, I thought this was funny. The promise of chocolate make market is overleaf. Exactly. Short dim bliss, one or two seconds high. Yeah. Good, thank you for that. That was, uh, that was indeed, a, that was indeed very, very useful to remind us of the. Uh, the, uh, the Sometimes it's nice with the chocolate, you have got to admit that, but uh, <laughs> you're right, it doesn't last very long. Okay, next one. Dear Ajahn, in the simile of the soul, apart from encouraging the to absolute compassion, uh, do you think the Buddha wanted to point out the cruelty and violence inside human beings? Uh, and that uh, similar bloody scenes would still be there 2,005 years later, and as long as mankind is on earth. Uh, I am stricken by such a graphic simile in a path of meta. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, yeah, maybe that is part of it. Yeah, no doubt that is part of it. And the idea that humanity is, I think, I think we are incorrigible when it comes to violence. And the reason why we are incorrigible is because it is a natural consequence of living in the sensory realm. Because we are competing over things in the sensory realm. Yeah, we are competing over limited resources, and because we are competing over that, we end up violence, we end up with conflict, we end up with uh, competition always leads to conflict and violence. Uh, and it kind of, this is one of the things, I think, the downsides of the kind of capitalist system that we live under, uh, because capitalism really is based on the idea of, of uh, competition. Uh, yeah? There's always going to be losers, there's always going to be some degree of violence and conflict based on that kind of economic system. I think it's just unavoidable. Uh, I'm not saying there is a better system, but I'm just saying that, you know, this is how the world, what the world is like. Yeah. I'm not here to get into politics. So. Uh, so I think it is unavoidable, and this is actually very yucky about the five sense realm. Yeah, the fact that violence is unavoidable. Now, there is a beautiful simile in the suttas that actually speaks directly to this. It's the simile of the lump of meat. Uh, and the simile basically goes like this. There's a bird that gets hold of a lump of meat. And when birds get hold of a lump of meat, they are very happy. Because usually they have to eat worms and insects and lump of meat. It's really prime kind of uh, uh, you know, goods for the, uh, for the birds. But if you are a bird and get hold of a lump of meat, other birds also want that lump of meat. And they're not going to leave you in peace because birds are pretty cruel. Have you seen birds sometimes, how they fight with each other? It's pretty harsh, yeah? You look at some of these birds, kind of the magpies, they have these small red eyes. If you look carefully, they look a bit demonic, yeah? There's a kind of demonic look about them. And they attack each other. And it's pretty, uh, I, I don't know, anyway, maybe I'm just reading too much into the eyes of the magpies. Uh. <laughs> so... That bird flies off with the meat, a piece of meat in its beak and other birds go after it, right? Because they also want that piece of meat. And these other birds are sometimes larger, they're stronger than you are. And they will rip that piece of meat out of your claws or out of your beak unless you give it up voluntarily. If you don't let go of it, you might die as a consequence. And this is a simile for the human realm, or the realm of the five senses. Uh, yeah? We are all competing over resources. Uh, we're competing over the same partners in life. We're competing over the same jobs. We're competing over the same ra rays at work, or of the same positions, or social position, or whatever. Yeah? Sometimes it's the same food. You know? I, I'm really glad you're very civilized, queuing up in the uh, queue upstairs, not fighting over the food. Well done. I'm, I'm really happy. Sometimes you get really hungry on a retreat, right? And you might kind of uh, <laughs> become, lose your... Uh, Civilization is sometimes so thin. Civilization is this thin veneer on humanity. It doesn't take much hardship before the non-civilized aspect of human being comes out. Yeah? We have this thin veneer. We may seem very kind of controlled until it gets difficult. And then the bad side of human beings comes out very quickly. So uh, we live in an inherently violent realm. This is the reality. There's no wonder there's a war in Ukraine. Of course there's a war in Ukraine. What do you expect? Uh, it's obvious there should be a war in Ukraine. Yeah, nothing has gone wrong. Everything has gone right with the war in Ukraine. Uh, right? <laughs> it's, it's neither right nor wrong. It's just the reality of the human realm. Uh, and so you... Uh, uh, so you kind of get a bit fed up with the five senses when you see that. Uh, you turn away from all of this because you understand, actually, yes, it is inherently violent. But if you go inside uh, and you just kind of, you, you gain the bliss from within, uh, there is no competition for the bliss that, the bliss that you get from within. Uh, that is your personal bliss. Uh, it doesn't lead to any violence. There's no competition about that. We Each one of us has their own bliss. Uh, and in fact, it leads to the opposite, because that bliss within, you realize very quickly, depends on harmony without. It doesn't work without, uh, without harmony without. And also, it tends to encourage harmony without, because you feel like being harmonious after you have a nice meditation. So it has the opposite effect, yeah? On the spiritual path, it leads to harmony. It leads a sense of kindness towards others, uh, but the five sense realm that always leads to violence and problems and competition and all of these ugly things in humanity. 
And uh, this, to me, is actually one of the really big kind of, uh, I don't know, turn-offs, uh, yeah, of that whole five sense realm there. You don't want to have anything to do with it anymore. Uh, we kind of let it go. Uh, so I think you're right uh, that it is inside human beings. Uh, and uh, so that is kind of part of the problem. And uh, then, indeed, you encourage absolute compassion and metta even, uh, despite that fact. Uh, and maybe we can talk a bit more about the... Uh, idea of metta as a symbol of the soul later on, because uh, many people will say it sounds impossible. How can you have metta towards someone who is sawing you limb from limb? You know, what would you do if a bandit came along and they kind of pinned you to the ground and said, yeah, we're going to saw you apart limb from limb, yeah? Are you, are you going to kind of say, oh yeah, you know, whatever, go ahead, yeah, yeah. I have metta for you and compassion for you. Are you going to say that or are you going to say, Get lost, or I don't know what you're going to do. Uh, it's a powerful simile, and it says something about uh, uh, something very powerful about the uh, how far metta can be taken if it is practiced in the right way. And so, it actually, it's a lot of insight can be gained from really understanding a simile like that. Uh, as I mentioned before, the Buddha is understated, uh, and because it's understated, you can take that a simile like that is actually meant literally. Uh, it is not meant as just an exaggerated example of you know, what we're supposed to be doing. No, it actually meant that that is our aim. It's a very high aim. It's a very high bar to clear. But it, still, it is kind of where we are supposed to be heading here. All right, let's um, go on to the next one. Here. Dear Raja, can you help us see through the apparent distinction between the knower and the known, perhaps uh, with the Bahya Sutta, one of my favorites, when we say, be aware of, uh, of it, aware of it suggests a self that is doing awareness, but I know that is not accurate. Thank you, that is not accurate indeed, you know. So the idea of the knower and the known is just two aspects of your experience. Yeah, your experience can be divided into different aspects. And one aspect of the experience is what you would call the object of your experience, right? The breath, for example, would be the object, or it can be the bliss can be the object, or it can really be anything that you are aware of, the thing that you kind of is the focus of your attention. And then there is the aspect of the experience that knows that thing. <clears throat> that would be called consciousness. So, and there's a feeling of kind of separation yeah, in your mind when you do that. There's a feeling of, I'm here, and I'm observing something over there, outside, or whatever it is. And this gives this kind of a, a duality sense in experience. But both the known and the known are just aspects of experience. We divide it up artificially that there isn't really any kind of real separation between the two. There can only be a knower when there is a known thing. It can only be a known thing when there is a knower. These two are inextricably linked with each other. And so they kind of depend on each other for their existence. And so for that reason, both are equally impermanent, both are equally unreliable, both are equally non-self. And you can see the fading away of these things. You can see how they sometimes disappear yeah, and kind of uh, come back again. And so then you know that they are non-self. Uh, but then again, in deep meditation, you don't have this uh, sense that the known and the known actually they merge, they become one single experience. Uh, and you lose that distinction between things. And this is kind of the Advaita, non-duality. Uh, in, uh, in Hinduism, or the Vedanta duration is called Advaita. And this is basically a state of pure samadhi, where samadhi becomes complete. Uh, <coughs> and uh, you lose that sense of uh, you know, ekata, one, you can, everything gets, uh, gets merged into one thing. Uh, that's kind of cool, you know, so we try to get there. Uh, all right. Mm. Okay. Is it possible to plan in this life where to be reborn next life? Or is it decided by Kama 100%? Um, is it possible to plan? Is it, is it possible to kind of direct? Um, 
it, it depend, remember that the kamma is often decided by what you, how you use your mind as well, right? So if you use your mind in a certain way, if you remember the good qualities of your life and you, you kind of die in a good mood, chances are you will be reborn in a good place. If you die in a bad mood, it's going to have bad consequences. Maybe, maybe not. It really depends. So yes, it does matter how you use your mind. And one of the things that you often do as Buddhists on someone's deathbed, we help them to remind them of kind of their, you know, the good things in their life, to kind of put them in a good mood so they can die in a good way and then hopefully also be reborn in a good way. So karma is the, it is 100% karma, but which karma ripens will depend on all of these other factors, right? So it is karma, but karma is so multifaceted. There's so many different kinds of karma that can ripen in your life. It can be the karma from this life. It can be karma from previous life that ripens. And this is specifically mentioned in the suttas that this can happen. And so it is always karma, but we can maybe make karma ripen in different ways with how we use our mind. And that is kind of important. Uh, is it useful to plan or try to be reborn in a particular place? I don't think so, because the Buddha never says we should do that. It's not really mentioned the suttas. And uh, I think that we probably will mess it up. Yeah, you kind of think, yeah, may I be reborn as a human? May I be reborn as a human? You kind of try to suggest this to yourself. But the point is that... What we want on the surface and what we want deep down is often different things. And what is going to drive your rebirth is not what you kind of say superficially, but it's your deep down desires that will come out and drive that process. And very often our deep down desires are actually very hard to gauge. And we don't really know what we want deep down. It's actually hard to understand yourself that well. One of the best thing, ways to find out what you really want deep down is to see what happens in meditation. Yeah, after you've been on this retreat for a few days, kind of the superficial things of your life have died down, and then your deeper desires kind of come out. Yeah, What uh, do you think about after a few days? What remains in your mind? Is your mind inclining towards peace once a few days have gone? If, if, that, if that is the case, well done. It means that your mind is inclining towards something good, and that is likely to be where you will head when you die. But if after a few days you're still thinking about the world and about sensuality, oh, I wish I didn't have come on this stupid retreat, what am I doing on this retreat, yeah, oh, it was a big mistake. <laughs> and then you indulge short thoughts about all kinds of things, yeah. then that means that your mind is still inclined towards those sensual, that sensual realm, and that is where you will go when you die. And it doesn't matter so much whether you make a superficial kind of a determination to go somewhere else. Your mind still inclines there. This is the inclination of the mind. This is what determines your rebirth and where you go. So it's hard to really know. So I would recommend allowing karma to take its course, because that's what karma does. So just chill, relax on your deathbed. Yeah? I, I, just the, you know, one of the things that I find really problematic about the uh, kind of this Theravada idea that on your deathbed uh, you have to have the last death moment is really important, right? The last moment, uh, if you've got a wrong thought in that moment, you are, that's it, you had it. You're going to go to a bad state. Yeah? So you have to have, the pressure is on on your deathbed yeah, to get the right thought on the last moment. Uh, and I think it's kind of crazy. Imagine dying and everyone can say, yeah, get the right thought. Yeah, you're dying. <laughs> okay. It's very unpleasant, right? So you so this whole idea of kind of having the last death moment right, I think it just destroys what should be a beautiful process. Uh, if you are a good person, dead dying is fun. Yeah, dying is great. To get rid of this blooming body that's been kind of diseased and all, and kind of had it anyway, you can probably, some, many people can barely see or hear when they eventually die and they get older. Or if you have some kind of terrible disease like cancer, your body is completely ravaged and, and in a terrible state. In those cases, if you've been a good person, dying is kind of nice, yeah. You're just enjoying the journey, enjoying the release of the body, just being peaceful, having a good time. And that is what dying should be like. It shouldn't be kind of, if you feel pressure is terrible uh, uh, when you die. So, and this turns out, of course, that this kind of whole idea of the last mind moment being so important 
turns out to be a false idea anyway. Yeah, that is not so important. Uh, like we discussed yesterday, there seems to be an Amtara Bhava anyway, an intermediate state. Uh, so that is where the whole, you know, Kamma, uh, kind of, um, the fruition of Kamma happens at that time, uh, yeah, when you have your life review and these kind of things. Uh, so don't worry about the last thought moment. It doesn't matter. Uh, just enjoy the process and then you, I would say, you are in business. Uh, and allow Kamma to take the course. And if you get reborn in the Devaloka, it is okay. It doesn't say anywhere in the suttas that the human realm is superior to the Devaloka. There are Devas who get enlightened. There are Devas who become stream enters. And uh, the, the uh, head of the Tabatinsa heaven, the heaven of 33, uh, the boss up there. Uh, yeah, some people might call this boss God. We just call him the, the boss. Uh, and uh, he is a stream enter according to the suttas. Yeah? So imagine living in a realm where the boss is a stream enter. Yeah? We wish we had more stream enters in the bosses in this world. Yeah? More like kind of uh, like the British Prime Minister could be a stream enter. That would be pretty cool. Yeah? <laughs> or the American president be a stream enter. That would be nice. Or the Russian president, uh, or whatever it is. Uh, that would be really, really nice. Maybe we wouldn't have a war in Ukraine if that was the case. So. I would say we're probably very, very unlikely to have a war uh, any, anywhere if uh, we had more stream enters in the world uh, leading uh, our societies. Uh, but I think unfortunately it is unlikely to have stream enters uh, running our societies because the job is just so unpleasant probably. Uh, sometimes we are down on politicians, but jeepers, it must be terrible to be a politician. Uh, I can't see how anyone can stand those jobs. Uh, so. Uh, no wonder that we sometimes get you know, dicey people in those positions. So, I don't know, I have a bit of compassion for the politicians actually. It seems like a terrible, terrible job, probably a lot of pressure from all sides and you kind of get molded into some kind of, you start out idealistic and kind of wanting to change the world and you get molded into this kind of dodgy character after a while and you do all kind of crazy things. Uh, it's kind of awful in a way, yeah. But uh, that's a different, uh, different thing altogether, so we'll leave that to one side. All right. <clears throat> I think it's useful sometimes to have compassion all the way around. I suppose the reason why I mentioned the idea of politicians is that society is often very hard on the politicians. Yeah, Everyone is down on them and they say how terrible they are, but uh, we should have compassion for everyone. Uh, and uh, I think it is uh, this wrong, this kind of general put down on politicians. I don't think it's such a good idea. Yes, they are not perfect. Yes, they make many mistakes. Uh, but uh, like everyone, it is uh, difficult. Uh, it is hard. Uh, and uh, sometimes we, uh, I think we are too judgmental about uh, everyone in this world, including our politicians. Uh, and at least as Buddhists, we should try to uh, up our game a little bit uh, compared to other people. Uh, Anyway, dear Aja, excellent teaching. Okay, good. I'm very pleased to hear that. So, uh, I find it difficult to wash my breath after 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, sometimes it disappears and thought comes in without my, no without my knowledge. Somebody say, uh, all right. <laughs> okay. Please kindly explain to overcome this difficulty. I could do body contemplation without interrupting. Uh, but I wanted to learn how to stay with my breath. Please kindly explain the matter. So, uh, <coughs> um, the, um, the, it disappears, yeah? Thought comes in and uh, disappearing. So, what do you have to do? And this is kind of the, the thing here. You have to really enjoy the breath meditation. That is the critical thing here. Probably the reason you can stay with the body is because there's a bit more going on. So it's easy to stay with it because your mind is a bit active. For the mind to be very peaceful and quiet, you have to really enjoy what is happening there. That is why I have spent quite a bit of time talking about bringing the joy into the meditation. Notice the happiness that is there. If you can stay with the breath for quite a while, 15, 20 minutes is already quite good, yeah? You have to just be clear where the, uh, where the joy and the happiness is in those 15, 20 minutes. Uh, and you will start to see that there is peace there, there, is a, there are many things going on that are delightful. So try to see those things. Uh, and then try to add more joy by some of those contemplations that I talked about before. 
Yeah, the idea of adding a bit of oomph to the meditation by a short contemplation, just the kind of the nudging of the mind towards joy. Yeah, and you're living well, you have, you're in good company. Uh, bring that bliss uh, with the breath. Uh, see your breath as a friend. Uh, see your breath as a Kalyanamitta, something that sustains your life. Have gratitude to your breath. Uh, and if you have gratitude to your breath, the breath becomes very beautiful. Uh, the breath becomes like, wow, thank your breath for being with me. Yeah, you wouldn't be far. We wouldn't have gone far without your breath. And so, uh, so this is kind of the way. You have to really learn to enjoy that breath. That is really the critical thing. Yeah. Um, so uh, if you enjoy it, the thoughts will not tend to come in because you have something more enjoyable than the thoughts. Uh, again, you can use the idea of understanding what kind of thoughts you have. Uh, yeah, you will find that generally the thoughts are about the five sense world, about all your activities and business and all these kind of things. Uh, and just remember, it is completely pointless. Uh, you're not doing anything useful by thinking those thoughts. Uh, those thoughts do not create your future. Uh, we think that we create our future by thinking about it, by controlling it, by solving the problems, but actually no, because there's always more problems behind. Uh, there's always more going on. This just goes around and around in circles forever. Uh, the future is created by the karma that you make, and that karma is created here and now by our attitude, by our peace, by our kindness, by the metta, by the compassion, by all the good qualities in our heart. That is where the future is created. That is what we should focus on. So it is really a kind of wrong outlook that tends to drive all that thinking mind. And I remember there was a fellow, he was at our retreat center in Perth, yeah, and he uh, one evening we had a kind of a note and he was explaining that uh, after three or four days uh, he had thought about everything possible in the world. Uh, there was nothing more to think about and his mind got really desperate. He had to think about something. Uh, and just that day he had washed some clothes. Uh, yeah, so he got the clothes out uh, and he said that, well, in, in his meditation he had hung them up on the kind of to dry. Uh, in his meditation he was kind of figuring out that best way to hang up his clothes, yeah, <laughs> to maximize the drying efficiency. Should it be upside down or the right way up, or, yeah, should it be exactly what is the optimal way? So he was kind of fantasizing about this in his meditation practice. And that is a sign of desperation, because yeah? <laughs> that is completely, utterly meaningless. But uh, it shows you that uh, the issue often is that uh, we're not enjoying the meditation. And because you're not enjoying it, the mind is desperate to find something else. So the enjoyment of the meditation is critical. And that is really where it all happens. So, uh, and sometimes, uh, um, just lean back. Yeah, don't do anything. Just enjoy being here. Just uh, don't watch the breath at all. <clears throat> if you're going to do walking meditation, for example, one of the common ways of doing walking meditation is to watch your feet on the ground. Yeah, you watch your feet, ding, 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 lifting, lifting, kind of the Mahasa technique, yeah, you're turning around, going back, but you don't have to watch your feet. Sometimes when you have done a lot of uh, samatha meditation or calm meditation here in the hall, if you start doing more samatha meditation outside or in the room over there, sometimes it's too much. Sometimes the mind needs a break. Yeah? And the idea of watching your feet is more calming meditation. Uh, so instead of doing that, uh, contemplate something. Contemplate something light and easy like death. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> because death is good fun, right? Uh, so contemplate a bit of death. Do some metta while you're walking. Yeah? What are the people in your life that you find difficult? Change your attitude towards those people as you're walking back and forth. How can I have compassion for these people? Really difficult, I really have a hard time, okay, but let me see if I can bring some compassion for these people. Uh, and that sort of way of uh, thinking uh, will kind of have a deep effect on your entire being, yeah, because you are sorting out some of the fundamental problems in your life and it will lighten up your mood in general uh, if you can deal with those difficult issues. Uh, so use it that way or just enjoy the walking back and forth. The weather has been, has been so beautiful. Uh, I was told that England is always rainy, but that was completely wrong. Yeah, yeah look at that weather. Yeah. It's a bit cool outside, but it's a beautiful, yeah, beautiful, crisp day. Yeah. Just enjoy walking around. Uh, go for a walk in the woods. Yeah, that's not walking meditation, perhaps, but uh, 
So don't follow the kind of strict idea that you have to kind of, you know, watch your feet when you do walking meditation. It's not really like that. Uh, in the suttas, uh, it is said that the uh, monks or the Buddha would do chankama. Chankama is the Pali word for walking meditation, uh, or walking. Uh, it never says what they did. Uh, it just says they walk back and forth. Uh, it never says that you have to do this or have to do that. Uh, so just don't, don't be too kind of uh, strict about it. Uh, yeah, enjoy, just enjoy the sunshine, enjoy the beautiful day, uh, enjoy the peace, uh, enjoy the good company. Uh, watch your mind, uh, get to know yourself really well, understand what your defilements are. Uh, the better you know yourself, the more ability you will have to counteract uh, those problems in your mind. Uh, yeah, so knowing oneself is very important on this path. Uh. All right. <coughs> Uh, okay, so why is the word of the Buddha more important than than something arahants? Than okay, um, okay. Can't we also listen to them? The Aran, something about arahants. Subsequent arahants. That's what it says. Okay. Tuck. Okay. Well, tuck. That's pretty pretty impressive. So here we have the Norwegian word for thank you. Tuck. So if you, if you ever want to know what the Norwegian for thank you is, uh, there you are. Tuck. Anyway, not sure if that is, that's not what we are here to learn. So anyway, just could I kind of put that in there just in case you wondered. Uh, um, yes, you can. Of course we can listen to subsequent arahants. Sure. Uh, the problem is that we don't know who they are. Yeah, that's kind of the problem in the world. So, okay, so in the suttas we have certain people who seem like arahants, like... Uh, Venerable Sariputta, Venerable Mahamogalana, uh, some of the famous nuns, uh, Venerable Kema, Venerable Upalavana, and some of these very famous people. And I think it is fair to think that they were Arahants. Yeah? I think that is kind of reasonable assumption, because they were around at the time of the Buddha, and they would have the stamp of approval from the Buddha. Yeah? The Buddha knew who they were. But... Uh, Later in Buddhist history, how do we know that someone is an arahant? Uh, yeah? In the present day, I don't know if you think, maybe you think Ajahn Brahm is an arahant. Uh, I don't know what you think. Yeah? Maybe he is, maybe he's not. It's hard to tell, isn't it? Uh, but uh, is he inspiring? Well, to me, he's extremely inspiring. And sometimes it doesn't matter so much whether he's an arahant or exactly what he is. Uh, I certainly have a, a lot of confidence in him as a teacher. Uh, when I look at the world and I see all these monastics around, what about someone like Mahasi Sayadaw, who started the very famous Mahasi tradition? Was he an Arahant? How would you know? Many people say he's an Arahant, right? Because um, I guess that's how it happens when you are a disciple of someone. You want your teacher to be an Arahant, otherwise you feel a bit, feel a bit kind of cheated if your teacher is an Arahant, not an Arahant. So we have this tendency to want our teachers to be Arahants. And so be very careful when you hear other people saying, this so-and-so is an arahant, etc., etc. Uh, and what about um, Ajahn Chah, Ajahn Brahm's teacher? Was he an arahant? Uh, maybe. Maybe not. Uh, very hard to know, right? Uh, what about many of these other monks in the world? There's lots of monks out there who have, and not so many nuns, but lots of monks who have very, very high reputations as arahants. Uh, and... Um, uh, many of them, in my opinion, are not Arahants at all. Yeah. So it's actually very, very tricky and very dodgy. And lots of people have completely the wrong idea of who is an Arahant and who is not. They don't have any understanding of what Arahantship actually is. So this is the problem in the world. Yeah? We listen to all of these people and then you may get the wrong information. You may get the wrong understanding. You may get wrong view because they're not really Arahants. So by going back to the word of the Buddha, we have the kind of the gold standard by which everything else should be compared to that, and then we are kind of on the right track. Yeah. So, uh, yes, uh, it is good to have living teachers, and uh, we discussed that yesterday, how to recognize a living teacher, did we? I can't remember now, but I think we did. Uh, you, uh, <coughs> so you try to recognize who a living teacher is by, no, wait, no, no that was the day before. That's anyway, Friday that was Friday night, okay, so that was a long <laughs> Things get very, uh, very kind of um, blended together after after a while after giving so many talks. But um, 
So you, of course, we try to recognize who a good teacher is by looking at their qualities and all of these kind of things, but there's always going to be a degree of uncertainty. It's very hard to know whether someone is an arahant. Uh, they may be inspiring, it may be great, uh, they may still have wrong view. Uh, and this is kind of so, makes it so difficult. Uh, so anyway, so there you are. That's the, uh, the brief answer to that one. Okay, <clears throat> dear Ajahn, what do the sutta say about fear? It seems to me that fear is a kind of delusion and clinging and attachment. Fear causes me to act in overcompensating ways and sometimes irrationally. <clears throat> what is the antidote to fear? Thank you so much. Okay, so fear is absolutely you're right. It is, comes from delusion and it comes from uh, uh, kind of a misunderstanding of uh, the world, if you like. Uh, and um, it is called one of the agates in the suttas, one of the wrong ways of acting, acting from fear. Uh, yeah, it is kind of one of the, you should never act from fear because it basically creates problems and you're acting from something wrong. Uh, so we should over, try to overcome fear. And the antidote to, uh, to fear um, <clears throat> is really to just recognize, I think, that, you know, fear is about kind of a, something about the future. Yeah, we are, not, we are con concerned about the future in one way or another. That's what fear really is about. Uh, we, are, we think that something bad is going to happen or whatever. Uh, so the obvious way of overcoming that is to practice the spiritual path and to know that anyone on the spiritual path is heading towards positive things. Uh, yeah? After a while, you get that feeling. You get the feeling that you're heading somewhere good. Uh, because the qualities in you are actually going up, they're getting better. And so just that knowledge, first of all, that people who practice well are heading towards light, are heading towards brightness, are heading towards happiness, are heading towards something positive, just that knowledge, yeah, the confidence in the word of the Buddha will already help you to overcome some fear, because you actually yeah, are heading in the right direction. And then as you live well and you do the right thing and as you start to have metta and compassion for the world that fear is going to die down very quickly the more metta you have the more compassion you have for everyone there is no room for fear when you have metta when you have loving kindness for the world loving kindness kind of fills you up in a way that makes you feel that the future is safe yeah the future is good and you cannot really have fear and loving kindness at the same time that's probably the antidote yeah, to uh, both to ill will and also to, to fear. Uh, there's a feeling that the future will be taken care of uh, when you have a lot of metta. So metta is really the uh, path out of, uh, uh, out of fear. And that is kind of uh, ideally I think what you should develop to avoid that. Uh, it is interesting. I, you notice that you know, from a psychological perspective uh, how we treat others uh, is how we feel that the world treats us. So if you treat others with a lot of kindness and care, you will feel that the world is kind and caring in return. Yeah, that's just kind of a natural, I think, psychological mechanism in human beings. We tend to see the world with how we, how we treat the world. So if you treat the people really well in the world, you will have a feeling that the world is kind and gentle in return. It's one of those beautiful and underestimated aspects of kindness, uh, yeah, that you uh, get this bonus uh, in uh, how the world uh, kind of looks at you back. Because yeah. there isn't any right way of thinking about the world. Uh, yeah? There's kind of, the world is just so uncertain, so unreliable. Uh, there is really the choice is really what is spiritually right way of thinking about the world. Uh, and the spiritual right way is always to look at the world with metta and compassion. Uh, and then you're going to be on the right track. All right, so we still have a few questions here, so let's uh, carry on. Hi, Ajahn Ramali, thank you so much for these teachings. Is it possible to wormhole into the Ekagata experience of non-duality, body and senses gone, no sense of self there, without going through the other jhana states? So, or only some of them. If this happens, what should we do next? <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, I wormhole. I, I don't know sure about the wormholes. Uh, I think you better leave those wormholes. Uh, I think that is uh, that is kind of quantum mechanics, and I don't want to bring that into the um, meditation state. I think that sounds a bit dangerous. Yeah, going to wormhole and bang into a kakata. <laughs> I'm not sure if that is um, uh, the best way. Usually, the uh, the way that these things are. Uh, Remember that meditation is gradual, right? Everything is really gradual in the human mind. And there is, of course, the awakening experience. It's maybe the one thing where it is not quite gradual because suddenly you get a different view and that affects you immediately. But almost everything else is gradual. You don't want to make go too fast. You don't want to make jumps that are too radical. Because if you make jumps that are too radical, you don't get used to it. That is where fear may very well arise. If you do things gradual and systematically, you get used to the feelings, uh, then it becomes possible to repeat them later on. Uh, and you feel comfortable, you feel at ease with these things. Uh, that is so important. Uh, but if you have this wormhole experience, and kind of bang, you enter the alternative universe yeah, of the second jhana without going through all this other stuff, uh, it's going to be too much. It's going to blow you away because it's just too far in one go. Even if that were possible, I don't, don't think it is possible now. Uh, you have to go gradually. And so you go through this experience of Samadhi we're talking about. Sometimes it can go very fast. Yeah? You can quickly go into these things. Other times it's really slow. You sit for an hour, you barely get anywhere. Other times it kind of goes really quickly. It depends on uh, where your mind is at. Uh, but go through it uh, and then come to the edge of the jhanas. Then come to the first jhana. If you have enough momentum, you go through the first jhana into the second jhana. If you have even more momentum, you go through the first, then the second jhana into the third jhana. But you always go through the same terrain. You have to go through all of these things. So uh, that is what uh, I think is the, uh, is the way that this actually works. And I think these quantum leaps can be... Uh, I'm not a good idea, actually. I, I always hear about people who suddenly go into some very deep state uh, and they actually end up, it ends up messing them up a little bit because it was just too much in one go. Uh, and then they get afraid of these states because they're so powerful. Uh, so better to ha have a degree of a kind of a safety net a little bit, if you like. Yeah. Okay, dear Ajahn, thank you for the elucidating and inspiring teachings. Uh, it is fascinating to learn that the basic Satisampajanya belongs to right endeavor and right restraint. Could it be here then that we work with the inevitable Dukkha Vedana of the body together as a painful feeling and mind to develop skillful ways of attending, perceiving, related to the more discomforting and afflictive feelings that human beings must encounter from time to time? Um, which would then ease the unpleasant experience, uh, impart strength and equanimity, and prepare the mind for the more refined feelings, uh, conducive to samadhi. Since unpleasant experiences is part of life, uh, it would seem unrealistic to expect to avoid it altogether, and also deprive one of the skillful necessary to encounter all age, sickness, despair, death, etc. wisely. For example, with sickness, instead of reacting with aversion, could part of the right effort restrain be to respond with compassion, kindfulness instead? Uh, yes, <coughs> absolutely. So dealing with feelings in the uh, painful feelings in the right way is obviously a very important part of this. Uh, and uh, you know, it's very easy to get uh, upset and uh, have ill will when things go wrong in life. Uh, and uh, that obviously is not really very useful. Uh, so uh, having compassion for yourself, yeah, not just for others, but also for yourself when you have problems, uh, is certainly a very important part of this. Uh, and uh, it's kind of, it's nice, because if you have compassion for others, you will tend to have compassion for yourself. Uh, if you have real compassion for yourself, not some superficial thing, you will also have compassion for others. Uh, they go together, because we are not really able mentally to separate others from ourselves. It's like a general compassion for humanity and because you are part of humanity you get part of the benefit of that compassion so uh, <clears throat> yes this is the right way of dealing with uh, uh, dukkha vedana um, uh, so uh, uh, 
yeah, in the end, it comes down to the idea of kindness, right? So regardless of what your experience of the world is, regardless of the painfulness of your experience, you should still be kind. Yeah? It is not an excuse just because you are suffering to be unkind to others. In one way, if you are suffering, it should give you more compassion for others because then you will have an insight into how everyone experiences the world, right? <laughs> One of the things that is always very useful is always when someone treats you badly or someone does something wrong, uh, always have compassion for them uh, because quite likely they are suffering in some way. Uh, they've had a bad day, something has gone wrong. Uh, it's kind of strange when you sometimes when you hear why someone is, is uh, doing something bad, yeah, you understand that they had a bad day or whatever, uh, suddenly you forgive them. Uh, but you shouldn't need to understand why they are doing this. You should always assume, always that should be the baseline, that they're having a bad day or something has gone wrong. So you always assume compassion when someone is doing something strange or treating you badly or whatever. Compassion should be the baseline in all of those cases. And uh, then you are really doing things in the way of the Buddha. The Buddha said to have the Maha Karuna, the great compassion. Yeah, he would go in to meditate after the meal and is often said to do this kind of meditation after the meal. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly why after meal. Maybe after meal, maybe you are. Ajahn Brahm always says that uh, if you're going to ask him a question, come after the meal because then he's really happy. Yeah. <laughs> maybe that's, yeah. So uh, Anyway, so um, yeah, yeah, I think you are on the right track. Yeah. So good. And... Uh, so let's carry on to the next one. <clears throat> okay, dear Ajahn, do we need to distinguish between mindfulness and concentration during the breath practice? Uh, at what point do we focus uh, on the breath at the tip of the nose? Uh, thank you. Uh, it, it's kind of, it merges, yeah? I mean, concentration or samadhi or stillness, as I would prefer to call it. Uh, um, it. One thing leads to the other. So when you have mindfulness, uh, if you use that mindfulness well, and this is kind of what this is about here, yeah? using the mindfulness to watch the breath, uh, if you use it in the right way, and you relax, and you are at ease, and you focus on the breath, uh, stillness comes. Uh, samadhi arises as a consequence of uses, using the mindfulness well. But these things are slightly different ideas. Mindfulness is general awareness. You know what's going on, but it's not one-pointed awareness. So samadhi and stillness is both mindfulness combined with one-pointedness, combined with only having one object in the mind. So stillness is always more further down the line than mindfulness. Mindfulness is more preliminary. Difficult enough already, but it's more preliminary. And then stillness arises from that. Uh, the two different ideas. Uh, so uh, at what point do you watch the tip of the nose? Don't worry about that. Just follow the breath. Uh, that will happen all by itself. Uh, yeah, this kind of this feed, this will just work by itself. Uh, you watch the breath, uh, and then the bliss arises. Yeah, when the bliss arises, uh, the breath is already very refined. This kind of fading into the background. Uh, you don't need to think about where you're watching the breath. Uh, just be aware of the breath. Okay, breath going in, breath going out. That's all you really need to know. Uh, keep it very simple and straightforward. Uh, and uh, anyway, that's what I would do. And uh, that is how I was taught by Ajahn Ram, and it seems to work uh, quite well. So, uh, see what happens then. Uh. Okay, for those of us who aren't familiar with devotional practices, uh, could you explain bowing, uh, both the meaning and the practicalities? Easy, when do lay people bow? Thank you, you bow exactly when you want. Uh, if you feel like bowing, bow. Don't want to bow, don't bow. It is common, uh, quite common, I think sometimes we bow a bit too much, actually we'll have to bow quite as much as we do, but anyway, it's common in uh, kind of Buddhist monasteries, for example, that you bow every time you come into a room. Yes, yeah? so every time there's like a Buddha statue in a room, you bow to the world, and when you leave the room, you bow as well. Yeah? But it's, you know, it, there is no kind of requirement for that. It's just kind of a habit that is kind of taken up in some of these monasteries. Yeah? So uh, it is entirely up to you. 
Now, of course, the idea of bowing is the idea is to bring up some good feelings. So, what are we actually bowing down to when you bow to the Buddha? Yeah, what you are bowing down to is the qualities that the Buddha statue represent. The Buddha is someone you bow down to the highest wisdom. <laughs> You bow down to the highest kind of compassion in the world. Yeah, the Buddha is no longer really a person in an ordinary way. There is no ego there. There is no self there. The Buddha has trans, kind of transcended the self, and all that really remains in the Buddha psychology are these beautiful qualities. That is what you bow down to. And if you bow down to kind of the highest potential in human beings, you're actually developing those qualities within yourself. Because you are respecting those qualities by bowing down to them. And when you respect them, uh, and the more you respect them, the more likely you are to develop them. Uh. So that is how you should bow down. Uh. So just bow down whenever you feel like it. Uh. You know, there is no kind of right or wrong with these things. Uh. Especially in the evening, we're gonna, we always do a bit of chanting just at the very end. Uh. We say, Arang Samma Sambuddho Bhagavatam Abhivade, which basically means I pay my respect to the Buddha or something like that. Uh. And uh, so then you bow, right? Uh, and uh, so feel, do whatever feels right. Uh, there is no kind of obligations at all to bow or to do anything in particular. It's entirely up to you. Uh, but that is the idea. You bow down to these qualities. Uh, you bow down to potential within yourself. Uh, you bow, and then you're building it up because you're bowing down to it. Uh, that is a good attitude to have. Uh, you're not bowing down to an idol. Yeah, sometimes I've heard people coming into monasteries, hey, are you Buddhist, you're just bowing down to idols. So, yeah, like, <laughs> but that's not really the point of Buddhism. The Buddha statue represents something else. It represents these qualities. That's the point. It is not an idol. It's not something we don't actually bow down to this piece of metal. This piece of metal is irrelevant. Yeah, it is what it represents, that what, what really matters. So, and then kind of we're on understanding what's going on. Uh, Okay, so I hope that makes sense. And if it doesn't, you're uh, very uh, welcome to ask again. Uh, all right. Maybe we should have a bowing class, how to bow in the right way. Yeah? There is kind of, there's lots of uh, technicalities there about how to bow in the right way, exactly the, kind of the details of bowing, uh, how your feet should be placed, which parts of your arms should hit the ground first, uh, where your head should be, yeah? whether you should smile or not. Uh, no, that's, you should always smile, that's all good. <laughs> anyway, so... Um, next one. Dear Ajahn, thank you for being such an inspiring teacher. You are very welcome. I'm very glad to hear that you get inspired. What a wonderful thing that is. I heard in a talk the Buddha said, never sacrifice your own welfare for the welfare of others. Uh, if it is true, in which suttas can I find this? Uh, never sacrifice your own welfare for the welfare of others. Uh, um, what the Buddha said in the some suttas is that uh, uh, some people live for the benefit of others. Uh, some people live for their own benefit. Uh, and some people live for the benefit of both. Uh, and uh, he said the best thing is to live for the benefit of both. Uh, the second best thing, and this is what is really interesting, is not to live for the benefit of others, but actually to live for the benefit of yourself. And that kind of goes counter to Western culture in a big way. And then the third person is the one who lives for the benefit of others. Yeah, and uh, the reason we should live for our own benefit rather than for the benefit of other people, uh, which, I mean, we should live for the benefit of both, really, but if we are going to choose... Uh, is because we are closest to ourselves. Of course we should look after ourselves first. We know our own feelings. It is easier to live for our own benefit than to live for the benefit of others. We don't really know how to look after others properly. We don't know what they feel. We know ourselves really well, so it makes sense to look after ourselves first. And then if we look after ourselves first, then maybe we can look after others. So where is this found? Hmm, that's a good question now. Where is this uh, found? Uh, can't remember, to be honest with you. It is somewhere there in the suttas, but uh, uh, at the moment it uh, 
I haven't come to remember reading that sutta for probably for a couple of decades, so it's kind of a very far away in my mind. But uh, it is interesting, right, that actually Buddhism turns this thing upside down, uh, yeah, very different from the ordinary ideas of Western culture. But ideally, we should live for the benefit of both. Uh, and this, to me, is a true kind of sign of a spiritual action. Uh, that if you do something that is good for you and for others, uh, that is a spiritual action. Uh, generosity is good for you and for the other person, obviously. Uh, kindness is good for you and for the other person. Uh, Mindfulness is good for you and for the other person, etc., etc. So we know that these are spiritual qualities. Selfishness is neither good for you nor for the other person. <laughs> so you think it's good for you, but actually it turns out to be bad for you. So, uh, so that is the closest I get, unfortunately. So I hope that satisfies your inquiry. If not, uh, I'm afraid that's the best I can do. So... Dear Ajahn, I can sometimes feel frustration that the goal of liberation seems so far away and I face so many challenges while walking the Buddhist path, five hindrances especially. Could you offer some words of encouragement? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you are a good person. You are here. You're doing really well being on this retreat. Good on you for being here. You're marvelous. You would never be here unless you were a really wonderful person already. Yeah, yeah? well done for being here. Yeah? You are a, it's marvelous to be with people like this. Yeah, All you have to do is to appreciate yourself a little bit more, having more loving kindness for yourself, and then take that loving kindness into the world around you. Yeah? And you're going to do incredibly well. You're going to overcome all of these bloom and hindrances. Yeah? And you're going to have less ill will, you're going to have less desires, everything's going to come together very beautifully. You know? Focus on ill will. Yeah? Ill will is the biggest of all the hindrances, it is the most destructive of all the hindrances. Huh? So focus on ill will. Learn how to have compassion in the world. Learn to have kindness in the world. There really is no need to have ill will for anyone. Huh? Everyone in this world is suffering. Huh? No one in this world has any idea what they're doing. Yeah? They are blind and they are deluded and they're kind of doing weird things. They may seem very powerful and they may seem to be kind of doing destructive things for others. Just because they're powerful does not mean that they are not deluded. They are deluded. So have compassion all around because people who are destructive, who do bad things for others, they too have no idea what they're doing. I don't know how to how you are thinking about the war in Ukraine. But I, when I see kind of what it goes on there, yeah, you see all of these young Russian men, mostly men, I think, yeah, kind of get sent into this war. Yeah. How old are they? Early 20s? Maybe even younger? I have no idea. Do they know what they're doing? Of course not. They're just barely out of their nappies. And they kind of get sent into, <laughs> sent into this war, right? And they don't have any clue what is going on. They're kind of manipulated by society to you know, to think that this is a good idea or whatever, and then they do these things, and then they do terrible things to other people while destroying their own lives at the same time. It's like a tragedy. It is not that they are evil, that they have no idea what's going on. How can you blame them? You cannot blame the victim, nor can you blame the perpetrator. All you can do is to have compassion all around for everyone. Everyone is just deluded. We're hurting each other in this world because of our delusion. It's like a Tragedy, it's like a Greek tragedy yeah, that is going on in this world. Uh, and then you can go up the military hierarchy among the Russian uh, generals or whatever, and they also are trapped in a certain way. They're trapped by the system. Uh, they've chosen a stupid career, for sure. Uh, but very often when we're young, we have no idea what we're doing. We enter the military because we need to make a living. There is nothing else. Our father was in the military. Our mum was in the military. We just follow along blindly because that's what is the family tradition. Uh, and then we end up as a soldier, and one day you are a general, one day you're commanding people into the war, and it's kind of, you are trapped by this. Uh, I don't know about you, when I look back at my own life, and I try to see, well, where did I make, it seemed at the time like I made choices in my life. Yeah, I decided to become a monk, yeah, that was a good idea, so I became a monk. Yeah. I had this kind of education, yeah, and it seemed like I made certain choices. Uh, but the more distance I get from those choices, uh, 
the more it seemed that it was inevitable. It wasn't really a choice. It was a cause and conditions uh, conspiring against me or supporting me, depending on how you see it, uh, yeah, depending on what you're doing. Yeah. And then you end up becoming a monk. Yeah. And I used to be really proud of being a monk. I thought, yeah, I'm smart, yeah, I'm wise. That's why I became a monk. I've chosen the best religion, yeah. One of those dodgy religions in the world, the best, only the best for me, yeah. And then the longer I, I thought about it, I realized that probably I was a monk in a past life or a nun in a past life. And uh, I'm now a monk again because of habit. <laughs> And that kind of concerns you, right? If you're a monk because of habit, how much wisdom is there in your choice? And once you understand that these things very likely are habitual things, actually what that made me do was to read the suttas even more carefully. Have I really chosen the right thing? If this is habitual, I better make sure that I've done made a good choice. So actually that insight into the fact that probably I've been a monastic in the past life and I'm just doing this because of that, Actually, that insight helped me to take the teachings more seriously, to really investigate what is going on there. And I do think that I am on the right track, right? Otherwise, I wouldn't have carried on like this. So, uh, it is not a bad habit, it's a good habit, right, to be a monk. Do you agree with that? Huh? Yeah? Okay, I'm glad you agree. Otherwise, I'd be in trouble. So, it's good that you agree with that. So, uh, um, uh, yeah, I have I completely lost track of what we're talking about now. <laughs> anyway, uh, so yeah, so we're talking about defilements and all of these kind of things, uh, right? Uh, so keep on just being kind. Uh, yeah, have compassion all the way around. Uh, the anger and ill will is the most biggest problem that we have. Uh, if you can deal with that, uh, then you're do doing really, really well. Uh, already. So make that one of the main things in your life. Learn to think in the right way about other people. Other people don't know what they're doing. If they treat you badly, they should, you should be compassionate towards them. Eh? You may think that's a hard ask. How can I be compassionate to someone who treats me badly? Eh? The reason you should be compassionate is because it's not personal. Eh? If someone treats you badly, it's got nothing to do with you. Eh? If they are in your face, kind of shouting at you or saying bad things towards you, actually it's got nothing to do with you. You just happen to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. This other person is the internal qualities of that other person that makes them do that thing. And you happen to be there. It's got to do with them, not with you. And the moment you realize that it is not personal, at that moment it changes everything. At that moment you can have compassion for that person because they are the one who has the problem. They are the ones making the good, bad karma. Okay, you have to bear with it for a short while that they're treating you badly, but you can deal with that. And especially if you have compassion, you can deal with it very easily, in fact. It barely touches you at all. You cannot look at them quizzically. Why are you so, what is, what's, your, what's your problem? Don't say that, of course, but you think that. If you say it, you get into a serious problem. So you just, uh, yeah, you have compassion for someone who does bad things, because basically, Anyone who does bad things uh, don't know what they're doing. Uh, they are crazy at that particular time. Uh, anger is madness, according to the Buddha. Uh, thinking like this is the way out of many of these defilements. Uh. All right. Dear uh, <clears throat> sometimes I cannot tell if I am meditating or between awake and asleep the space. Uh, any advice? Thank you. Um, yes, it probably means that your mindfulness is kind of going down a little bit, uh, yeah, because you are probably lacking a little bit. Uh, uh, your kind of mind dulls out and you're not probably not enjoying the meditation as much as ideally you should. So it always comes back to this idea of enjoying what you are doing. Yeah. yeah? So uh, just go for a walk a little bit, have a cup of tea, uh, look at the beautiful weather, come back in again and try again uh, if you find you get too dull in the meditation. Uh, and then try these ideas of uh, uplifting your mind. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of really positive things going on on a retreat like this. Uh, uh, so much uh, positive feelings. I don't know, I, I usually find that these kind of retreats, it's a very good feeling, good atmosphere. Uh, yeah, you are with good people. Uh, there's a, there's a 
this kind of uplift uh, just by being so tune into that atmosphere more. You feel the goodwill and the kindness of the people around you. There's a lot of kindness in a space like this. Uh, inspire you in this way. That will wake you up, uh, make it very clear that you are mindful because you are enjoying what is going on. Uh, it's one of those things that you find in the suttas, that there are certain qualities that always go together. Uh, if you have joy, uh, you also have mindfulness. Uh, if you have joy and mindfulness, you also have energy. Yeah? Joy, mindfulness, energy tend to, tend to work together. Uh, because if you are joyful, uh, you want to be present. Uh, because the presence is actually happy, so of course you want to be present. Uh, and when you have presence and joy, the energy comes with that as well. Uh. So this is really the uh, kind of holy grail of meditation practice. Uh. I'm not sure if the Christians will agree with me using that concept in that way, but anyway, that's, uh, that's the way it works. So. Okay. Dear Ajahn, I, we're going to run out of time a little bit. We've got a few more questions. Let's see how we go. Dear Ajahn, thank you for the lovely, peaceful retreat. Wow, that is very nice to hear. I'm glad you are enjoying it. How do I deal with interruptions, e.g. jobs which needs doing, keep it coming to my mind during meditation? Um, so this, again, is really about... Uh, Trusting that those jobs will get done when the time is right. If a job needs doing, have a piece of paper next to you, write it down. Yeah, so you don't forget. If you are afraid of forgetting it, write it down. Yeah, and sometimes that can be useful because once it's written down, you know kind of it's taken care of, especially at the very beginning of meditation. That can be a nice thing to do. So have a piece of paper next to you, and everyone will look at you scribbling away, and <laughs> wondering what you're doing in your meditation. But that's, that's all right. Don't worry about what other people think. Just scribble to your heart's delight. And uh, this can be a nice way of kind of getting uh, over that kind of feeling that you need to remember something. Uh, but otherwise, it's just this general idea that, remember, you cannot control your work anyway. You cannot actually make, you cannot control that world. Uh, you're not actually going to make the future again yeah, by thinking about your jobs. Uh, the best way of making the future is to prepare your mind for those jobs. Uh, and when your mind is really prepared, it is peaceful, you have a sense of kindness and metta within, then those jobs are going to work. Yeah, They're going to work out in a nice way. Uh, and this is kind of the... Uh, Beautiful way of thinking about this. Trust them that it will work out. Uh, um, the good heart usually has good results. Uh, and uh, I think that is the best way of thinking about this. Uh, so uh, leave all those jobs to one side. Uh, come to the, get your priorities right. Remember that what really matters in life is the spiritual path. Uh, everything else is secondary. Uh, even, to get, even if you get fired because not of your job, as I said before. Uh, Shrug your shoulders, okay, good riddance, yeah, and then you kind of, you, you carry on. Uh, it's a nice attitude, isn't it? Uh, it means that there's nothing to worry about. Uh, maybe it's easy for me to say I'm a monk. Uh, I don't get fired, no one can really find me very easily, you know. Once you're a monk, that's it. Uh, you are, no one can take it away from you. Uh, so maybe I should be more, uh, have more compassion for you, who actually haven't got that kind of job security. Uh. <laughs> Anyway, something like that, yeah? It's hard to really... Uh, so we have a few more questions. I don't know if I... Probably a little bit too many to go through. I'll do one more, and then I think we should probably stop. Uh, how is mindfulness meditation... Uh, treat pain? Thank you for... Why? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> How is that for meditation? Can I help? Uh, to treat pain? Something like that? Uh, how can it use to treat pain? Uh, I think that's kind of the question. Uh, how is mindfulness meditation used to treat pain? Used to treat pain, okay. So that's kind of what it, Okay, good. So we are on the right track there. Okay, good. So how is mindfulness meditation used to treat pain? Uh, um... It is, uh, it is not really used to treat pain. It is, uh, I think, the uh, part of the mindfulness meditation is that you make it into less of a problem. Uh, because when you have the awareness uh, of things, uh, you don't proliferate so much about it. We have more just pure awareness, uh, less proliferation. Uh, 
the Buddha has this kind of beautiful sutta that he calls the two darts sutta. One dart is the physical dart of the body, and the other dart is the dart of the mind. And uh, the Buddha says that even though you have pain in the body, you don't have to have the mental dart. In other words, you don't have to grieve or to be sad or to make a mental problem out of the physical problem. Uh, and the vast majority of suffering in the world comes from the mental dart, yeah, that we actually make a problem out of the physical dart. Uh, so the idea here is to try to be aware of that painful feeling without really reacting too much mentally to it. Uh, and uh, one way of doing that is to develop things like metta and compassion yeah, for yourself and for others. Uh, and the more you have all these good qualities in your mind, uh, the less problematic that pain will actually be uh, because you have something else to focus on. Uh, you have an alternative that is more powerful than the pain, uh, more important than the pain. Uh, and so you can kind of lean the mind towards those positive qualities. Uh, so it's always useful to develop the metta, the loving kindness and the compassion in your life. And as you do that, you, there is an alternative uh, focus that you can use that then overcomes uh, yeah, or makes the pain less problematic. Yeah. But uh, pain is, there isn't really any easy way of overcoming pain in meditation. If there is medication that you can use that does not make you drowsy or whatever, please use that pain medication because uh, there's no point in just being aware of pain for pain's sake. You want to get rid of that pain uh, because pain is painful now. And uh, then there is maybe a chance that your meditation will come together as a consequence. Maybe. So, but it's not, there's no easy solutions to pain. All you, what you really have to do is to develop alternative good qualities uh, that you can focus on and keep your mind on instead. Uh, there's a few questions left here, so we'll do those uh, tomorrow. So maybe they can be put to, uh, on the top of the pile or something here. And then uh, we will do those first uh, uh, tomorrow evening here. So that is uh, all for, to now, for now. So I wish you all a wonderful and peaceful night and a good night's rest. Uh, and so you can be bright and clear tomorrow morning, continue meditation. Now let's do the uh, 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 homage to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha to finish off. And again, it is voluntary. Yeah, only if you want to take part, uh, should you take part. Uh, okay. <coughs> Arahang Sama Sambuddha Bhagava Buddhang Bhagavantang Adivademi Svakato Bhagavata Dhammo Dhammang Namasami Supati Pano Bhagavatu Asava Kasango Sangang Namami